Chicago, and it's an especially nice moment to be in Brazil because in Chicago it was shoveling snow. It was minus 20, and so it's perfect timing. And so just a few words on these lectures. First, on the logistics of these lectures. I'm going to use the board, but they have very extensive lecture notes that you can find on this web page over there. And actually, this is linked uh, from, from the, the website of the school. And then there's a GitHub associated with this, like the one that generates these pages. And here, you can also find a PDF if you want to like, print the notes. It's not a super nice PDF, but still. And so like, the idea is to take you on a tour of the generalized Lotka Volterra model. And you have seen probably this model before if you were here like this uh, past week. And you might think, now we're going to draw a lot of isoclines in, in this kind of phase space. But we will not do this, because this will be a generalized Lotka Volterra with a twist. And the twist is we're going to consider only the case in which we have many species. And, and, um, I, I try to collect from a, a bunch of different sources that you actually can find here, some of the main ones, to collect facts that make up for a story. And they make up for a story that is like a, a murder mystery. So as in any murder mystery, today I'm going to introduce the main characters, right? And you should uh, ask questions if something is not clear, because these characters then will start doing things in the next uh, few episodes right, of, the, of this tour. Uh, so like, we have the lecture notes. These lecture notes actually contain a bunch of code. So let me show you just an example of that. So this code is code in R. If you want to run it on your computer, I will try to run this on this computer here. But if you see like, in the upper right corner, you get like, this copy to clipboard, and then you just copy this. And then you can paste it into R as it is, and this should work. Now, the interesting fact is, each lecture is independent, right? So, so you can basically copy the code starting from the top of the lecture to the bottom. And this doesn't work anymore, for example. Copy this thing. Does it copy or not? It did it this morning. No, it doesn't do it anymore. Anyway, I, I, or you can select this whole thing and, and then copy <laughs> and then paste it. And it should do something. OK, now it did something. But now it does only errors. So it would work better on a computer. Hopefully, it will work also on this computer eventually. Let me start. Oh, you, but you see, now you get stuff. All right. Uh, and so you can run this code. I will comment on the code. I will not go into the depth of the code unless asked. So, so you, should, you should ask me questions if you want to know more about the code. Uh, other than that, I will follow this lecture and do them on the board. Please interrupt me if anything is not clear. Please interrupt me if you have questions. And so like, just to start, as in any good murder mystery, you know like the first page lists all the characters that would be appearing in this, uh, in this mystery. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to introduce several characters. And of course, given that we're talking about the generalized Lotka Volterra model, the first two characters that we should introduce are Lotka and Volterra. So Alfred J. Lotka, that was born in 1880, was a, a kind of an amazing uh, scientist, but also uh, somewhat a, a, of a maverick. Like, he was not really well embedded in, in academia. He had like, a very international up upbringing. He was born to American parents, but in the Habsburg Empire, in, in what is now Ukraine, and then went to, to study in France, then in Germany, then went to the UK, then went to the US, came back to the UK, went back to the US. So he was like a globe trotter that way. And you can actually see from the list of jobs that he held, which include working at the patent office right in the US, not in Switzerland, <laughs> and then an editor of Scientific American. He also worked as a statistician for an insurance company. So like the, the papers on Lord Cavalterra are actually published under the, uh, this uh, life insurance company, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company <laughs> in New York City. And he wrote like more than 100 papers, five books. And these papers are almost on anything that you can imagine. Right? So, so he was very, very broad. He's best known for, at least in, in ecology, for these elements of physical biology, where he takes this kind of chemical slash ecological approach and introduce like, many of the equations that we, we're, we're going to see today, but also for his contribution to demography. And strangely enough, 
to bibliometrics. So he has this paper that he cited there in 1926. It's like on the number of papers like that the scientists produce over a lifetime and who are the men of large caliber, he says, like <laughs> in, the, in this setting. And then he had these kind of interesting uh, dynamical systems, especially from a, a very chemical point of view, and he started studying this type of equation in 1910. In 1920, there's a, a nice paper in PNAS where he, I want to read this quote because I think it's fun, where he says that it was therefore with considerable surprise that the writer, on applying his method to certain special cases, found these lead to undamped and hence indefinitely continued oscillations. Right? So, so this was a case of an autonomous system keep oscillating in perpetuity. And if you've read, like, recently an issue of Nature, there was a nice paper where they, they showed this Lotka Volterra cycle type of thing for 300 generations of the predator. And, and he really had the ecology in mind, saying, for example, there's a species of an organism, S1, a plant species, say, deriving its nourishment from a source presented in such large excess that the mass of the source may be considered constant during the period of time in which we are concerned. And then a species two, S2, for example, a herbivorous animal feeding on S1. So, so you really introduce this equation in the context uh, of ecology. And these are actually the equations that now we call lotka volterra equation. Switching to Lotka, uh, from Lotka to Volterra. Volterra was a little older, right? He was born in, 19, in 1860, so he was 20 years older than, than, than Lotka. He was born in Ancona, in a bad time, in a bad place, in a bad situation, because he was like uh, coming from a very poor Jewish family in the papal state, which you can imagine is very friendly to Jewish people, <laughs> just before the advent of fascism, which was also very like, easy thing to do. To make matter worse, his, died, his dad died when he was two, and so he and his mother had to go and live with an uncle that kept moving from place to place, you know, looking for, for a decent job. Fortunately for him, he displayed such an amazing mathematical talent very, very early on that uh, when he was living in Florence, the, uh, this professor of physics, Antonio Roiti, decided he was probably like in middle school or high school to hire him as an assistant, such that he could continue his studies instead of like, going and working. Uh, so he enrolled in the University of Florence, and then from there transferred to the, the Scuola Normale in Pisa, which is like, uh, the, uh, still today like, very famous for mathematics, but at the time was the non plus ultra of mathematics. He graduated in physics in 1882, so at age 22. Age 23, he was made full professor of rational mechanics. And then uh, after a few years, in 1900, he moved to, to Rome to, to, as a professor of mathematical physics. He was a mathematician working in analysis in functional theory. And uh, he contributed a lot to science, not only like, to, through his paper, but also like organization. For example, he was the first president of the CNR, the National Center for Research in Italy. He was a, a president of the Accademia dei Lincei, which is like one of the oldest uh, academies like for science. Galileo Galilei was part of this academy back in the day. And then he was one of the most like, staunch opponents to the fascist regime such that in 1931, all the university professors, and there were 1,250 of them, were required to make a note to, to swear their allegiance to the fascist regime. And uh, Volterra was one of the 12, so one in 100, that refused. And then he had to leave his post and was like, uh, sent uh, in exile out of Italy. His take on the fascist regime that I like very much says, empires die, but Euclid's theorem keeps their youth forever. Right? So how come then that, you know, age 60, he got interested into ecology? Like, and he was drawn into ecology because he had a daughter, and his daughter married an, a biologist, a fish, a fish biologist called Umberto D'Ancona, that was working in the Adriatic Sea, and especially was studying like fisheries before and after World War I. So during World War I, the Adriatic Sea was like uh, uh, in the middle of the war, and so like all the fisheries were halted because the, there were mines and it was very dangerous to fish. And so they had data on before and after the war. And Umberto d'Ancona had noticed something interesting that certain species of fish, uh, the herbivorous fish, had kept basically the same density before and after this blockade of the fisheries industry, while other fish, piscivorous fish, so carnivores, had increased dramatically. 
And so I can imagine like this lunch going on, you know, in Italy, uh, Sunday you have to go to your in-laws for lunch, uh, and he's telling like this old professor about this problem, and this guy was like, we should write a differential equation, right? So, so in five minutes probably, he wrote this differential equation, then did a very uh, intri intricate study of this thing that is actually the 1926B paper that is like a, a memoir of the Lincey Academy paper that is very long, and then decided to send this short note to Nature, and you can read this 1926A, where there's no equation. These equations are described in English, which is not the best way to write equations. We're, we're actually going to write equations on the board because I think it's easier to understand. And, uh, and he described several like regularities that he had found, and one of them, especially what he called law number three, which was what we call now the Volterra effect, is exactly this effect in which predators would increase but prey would not uh, when we, we reduce mortality. And that's the way he describes it. A complete closure of the fishery was a form of protection under which the voracious fishes were much the better and prospered accordingly, but the ordinary food fishes of which these are accustomed to prey were worse than, off than before. Right? So these were like his results. Now, we always talk about lotka volterra interactions, but now I'm going to talk about the interactions between Lotka and Volterra themselves. <laughs> so, so, of course, Volterra wrote this paper in Nature, and Lotka read Nature. And so like, the next year was like, you know that paper that, that you published like, last year? I have exactly the same equation, exactly the same figures that you have in your paper in my book that was published the year before. <laughs> right? And so there's this nice letter that is kind of a bit, uh, I mean, it's passive aggressive from, 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 from Lotka. <laughs> And he concludes, it would be gratifying if Professor Volterra publication should direct attention to a field and method of inquiry which apparently, as Heiderdo, passed almost unnoticed. Right? So, so he was like, maybe this can make this work of mine more relevant. And, uh, and Volterra graciously conceded like, priority and whatnot, says, I recognize his priority, and I'm sorry not to have known of his work, and therefore not have been able to mention it. But then he lists like, points of difference between the two, and then concludes that working independently the one from the other, we have found some common results, and this confirms the exactitude and interest in the position of the problem. I agree with him in his conclusion that these studies and these methods of research deserve to receive greater attention from scholars and should give rise to important applications. Right? So, so this was like the birth of this Lord Cavalterra model that we're going to uh, explore today. And I have to say, they were successful. It's been almost 100 years of studying these equations. And we have to teach them to all the students, right, to become a, a patent, like a, a card-carrying member of the ecological community. You have to have seen log Voltaire equation with two species, right? So, so today we're going to uh, just, like, deviate slightly from, from this idea and just, like, consider the case with very many species. So the first main two characters are log Voltaire, And, of course, the third character that we're going to explore is their model. And I'm going to write it... In matrix form, if you like. Oh, this, I cannot use that. Let's see this one. So if, if you cannot see my, my writing, next time you can sit closer, or I can write larger. <laughs> and I'm going to drop like the T. You know, all the X are functions of T. And then we have a diagonal matrix here with X on the diagonal, R plus AX. Okay, so this is in matrix form, or if you're more familiar with like component form, we can write dxi dt, and so then we have xi times ri plus the sum over j of aij xj, right? So this is our model. So what are the parameters involved with this model? We have x, which we believe represents the density of a certain species or like the biomass or the total number of individuals of a certain species at time t in a certain place. And then we have these uh, growth rates r. These are called the intrinsic growth rate. The way to think about them would be if I take these species, introduce in the environment a very low abundance without the other species being there, it will initially grow very fast. Take the log of that. That's like the, the initial growth rate. And then this growth rate is modified by what? By interaction with either themselves, what we call intraspecific interaction would be the diagonal of this matrix or the element AII here, and the presence of the other species. And this presence of the other species or, or, or of conspecific is mediated by their density. Okay, so, so this is like the, the, the basic idea. 
And the simplest version of this is what? One system in which we have a single population, in which case we go to the case of n is equal to 1. And I told you we're going to talk about n much greater than 1. But just for, 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 for good measure, we can write this equation for, for one species. And so now we have dx dt is x times r plus ax. Right, so, so this is the simplest case. This is the famous logistic equation that you've all seen. It's a separable differential equation, so I can separate the dx on one side, dt on the other side, integrate both sides. And what I can do then is to actually find a solution for this equation. A solution of this equation means, provided with initial condition, I can project this forward at any point in time and tell you exactly how many of these species x were at the point, you know, in the environment of interest at that time. And so the solution, is like x of t is what? I, I write it like this. R, x0 would be the, the population at time 0. So x of 0 is equal to x0. And then e to the rt, right, where r is the uh, growth rate and t is the time where we want to evaluate this. And then below we have r minus a, x0, e to the rt, minus 1. All right, so this is our solution. And this is basically the only case of Lotka Volterra that we can really solve and, and tell what's going to happen to all the species at all times, right? So, so this is a very, very special case. And now, if my computer decides to collaborate, otherwise you can try it on your own. I just wanted to show you how do you, would you code this up in R. And so in R, there's like a nice package that's called DE solve, that is like to integrate differential equations in a computer. You have different solvers that you can use. And what you really need to do is to write a function where that takes three uh, parameters, like t would be the time uh, at which you're, you're evaluating this function. x would be the state of the systems or the population in this case at that point. And then parameters is just a list of all the parameters in your system. In this case, we have a list with a vector, r, and a matrix a, or a, in this case of one uh, equation, just two, two numbers, right? And then we compute this dx dt exactly as we did on the board. Then we can define like time of integration. We want to go from time zero to time 100, where 100 means what? It can mean anything it could be 100 days, 100 hours, 100 years, depending on what you choose for the time scale of the parameters, right? And then we need to decide an initial condition. In this case, we start with the low abundance. And then parameters, I choose like a positive growth rate, a negative effect of conspecific, which is the typical case that makes sense. And then you just integrate this differential equation. What I wanted to show you is that these, the solution of this equation, you can actually uh, um, just map it into exactly the same solution. So if you see this line here, solution is exactly what we have on the board here. Right? So, so we, we say for each time t, I can compute the solution analytically. And sure enough, because mathematics works, we have like uh, in the black, we have the numerical integration. And in red, we have the points. For, for, for this, OK? And you can try by copying and pasting if you can copy and paste this page, which I don't know why I cannot. Let's try one more time. And now, why did I choose like a positive growth rate and the negative effect of conspecific, do you think? What happens if I put, like, for example, a positive effect of conspecific? So alpha a greater than 0. What would happen? Right, it would grow for forever and grow faster and faster and faster, which is not what we see biologically happening. So that's not an interesting uh, case. Right, what if I put a negative growth rate and a is equal to 0? It, it, it will just like uh, decay exponentially fast and go extinct. Right? Uh, so like the only case that is uh, of interest is really what uh, uh, we're modeling here, right? Positive growth rate uh, and negative uh, intraspecific effects. Now, what is interesting is like, what happens if I start, uh, you can see that there's some sort of asymptotic, right? Initially, the population grows very fast, then it slows down, and then it reaches a sort of asymptotic density, in this case, two, right? What happens if I start it above two, do you think? It will taper off like and go back to two, right? So, so this is what we would call like that given any initial condition that is greater than zero and the fact that R is positive, A is negative, it's always going to go to the same place. 
Right? We will refer to this later as some sort of global stability of this point. Okay, so this is very interesting. Not really, but, but, uh, but we can solve for what is this asymptotic state where, where we're going. So we have our equation, and we can set, uh, you know, if this is asymptotically rich, like what we will have is that dx dt at that point will be zero, what we call an equilibrium. Uh, and so what we can do is to say we can solve this equation equals to zero. And this can happen for two reasons. The simplest is there's no species to speak of, right? So if I have zero elephants in this room, they will keep being zero elephants in the room. And then if this is not the case, then this part must be zero, right? And then we can say r plus ax is equal to zero, which means that x will be minus, r, a, minus a over r, right? A, a, a minus r over a. And typically, you put like a little star here to say this is a fixed point of the system, right? So if I start at this condition, the, the system is not moving, right? The x dt is zero and will remain zero for forever. Now, this model is like the model for, for the growth of a single population, but I wanted just to have like two brief sections showing you that this model shows up in unexpected places in ecology, and it shows up a lot. The first place where it shows up is so-called metapopulation dynamics. So the idea here is that we have a species of interest. We're interested in studying this particular species of butterflies that, that can live in these patches like a, a, where, where there's this kind of meadow and it's in, they're dispersed between like, a, I don't know, a forest or something. A, and so what we have is like a bunch of what we would call habitable patches, right? So the, the butterfly can live here, here, and here, and here. And then what we want to track is how many patches we can find a butterfly, right, in how many of these patches. And we will call these a proportion of patches because we, we imagine there's very, very, very many patches. Uh, and there's a certain proportion of patches that is occupied. We call this P of T. This is a proportion of patches where we can find a butterfly. Because this is a proportion, 1 minus P of T would be what? the proportion of patches where there's no butterfly, such that they sum to one, which is great, right, because it's a proportion. Now what happens is that patches that are occupied can send butterflies to patches that are non-occupied and colonize them, right? We call this the colonization rate. And similarly, but the opposite process is like we have a patch where there's a butterfly. If we wait for long enough, it goes extinct. And so this is the way in which we turn uh, filled patches to empty patches, and we call this the extinction rate, right? And so I call C colonization, E extinction, and then I can write an equation describing the proportion of uh, patches that are uh, occupied by the, by the butterfly in time. And this is exactly what Richard Levins did when he was at the University of Chicago, actually, in 1969, right? So the equation reads, uh, we have dp dt, and then we describe these two processes. The simplest is patches that are occupied uh, become empty, right, with rate E. So we can write minus E of P, right? And this is like, the, it has to be proportional to how many are occupied at a certain time. And then we can write the colonization. And so if we imagine that these arrows connect any two patches and that these distances are short enough that butterflies don't really care about this distance, then we can say it's like we can just write not as a network, but as some sort of mean field uh, 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 case. Uh, and so then we have with C is the colonization rate, P is the proportion of patches where the butterfly lives, and these can colonize what? The ones that are empty, P1 minus P, okay? Now, you look at this equation and is it possible to turn this equation into this equation? And of course it's possible, right? Because we have like linear terms and then we have a quadratic term. So I can write this as a P times what? Colonization minus extinction minus CP, right? Which is exactly the same form of that. And therefore, it has exactly the same type of dynamics, right? If we look at the proportion of patches that will be colonized, will reach uh, rapidly some sort of asymptotic. The asymptote will be what? We have to do minus r over a. Our r is now like uh, c minus e. Our a is minus c divided by c. So this would be the 
the equilibrium for the system. Okay, so just to say this is take a problem that is in principle nothing to do with, with Lotka Volterra, recognize that this is exactly the same problem, then you have exactly the same solution. Now, another area in ecology and evolution. Let's think about disease modeling, right? We have a population, and this population we can divide people into classes, and we're going to write only two classes, those that are susceptible to a disease, right? And those that are infected and infectious with the disease. And then let's imagine the simplest model, which is we have a closed system. Somebody initially has the disease, and then when they recover from the disease, they become susceptible again, right? So, so what we have is susceptible can become infected, and this will happen when they bump into each other. They have a certain probability of transmitting the disease. So, so this will happen with a rate that depends on the, the transmission rate and the number of infected. And then we have some other process in which the infected individuals recover and become susceptible again. And this is what we call an SIS uh, model. Right? And this is my recovery rate that we call beta. So in this case, I write two equations, right? I can track the proportion of people that are in S and the proportion of people that are in I, such that the two proportions sum to one. And so I can write ds dt, and then I write di dt. And then I, I can do exactly the same accounting that I was doing here. So how do we lose a susceptible? Susceptible must become infected, so we have this, uh, oh, sorry, I call this beta in the note, beta and gamma. We have this transmission rate, mass action, right? When things meet at random, they can transmit the disease. And then we have those that recover from the disease, gamma i. And then because this is a, a fixed proportion, they must sum to one, then dx, dx dt and dy dt, di dt must sum to what? If this in general has to be constant, they must sum to zero, right? In fact, these are exactly the same equation with a minus in front, right? So these are the ones that enter the infectious from the susceptible, and these are those that are lost to the infected to the susceptible, right? such that the, the sum of this has to be zero. And now if the sum of this is to be, has to be zero, it means that we can express one of the two classes as one minus the rest. Right? For example, I want to write uh, the, the equation for the infected here. I could substitute S, I could put one minus I, right? and get the same type of equation. And now what we would have here? We would have a quadratic term, a linear term in I. So what is the solution to this model? Who can tell me? This model is exactly that model, which is in turn exactly the other model that we wrote. Right? What is the equivalent of the growth rate here for the infected? You want to do the algebra? Let's do the algebra. All right. So what I want to do is just rewrite this with beta in front and put S here. I put 1 minus I, so I have beta times 1 minus I, and then I minus gamma I. So you can see that I can take I out times, and then we get beta minus I minus gamma, which is equal to what? I times A beta minus gamma minus uh, um, beta i, beta i, right? So this is the equivalent of my growth rate. This is the equivalent of my interaction, right? And so the, these are, or you can think, colonization, extinction, potato, potato, right? This is exactly the same thing as before, all right? This is interesting for one, a species one equation, but it's actually holding up generally, right? So you can write a multi-species or multi-patch system with a network and whatever you want here, and you could interpret this as patches and this metapopulation dynamics, or you could think of the same as an SIS, SIS system in which people get colonized with the disease, and when the disease goes extinct, it means they recover from the disease, right? And all of these, therefore, have a very, very strong connection uh, to Lord Cavalter. All right. That's all I'm going to say with the case of n is equal to 1. And now we're, we're going to do things a little more generally. So here we found the stationary state or equilibrium or fixed point, uh, x star. 
And so we could think, can we do this in general, right? Can we write this uh, X star for uh, the case of n species? And of course, uh, we can, otherwise I would not be talking about it. Uh, 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 and so like as before, we have our equation, right? That is D of X, R plus A X, and this has to be equal to zero for all I, right? For, it has to be the vector of zero, in fact. Right, so how do we make this zero? As before, we could either make this part zero, meaning these pieces are absent, which is not super interesting, or make these parts zero, right? In which case the species are present, but the interactions cancel each other such that we have zero growth rate. And so if the system is a system of equations saying Ax has to be equal to minus r, if the system of equation has a solution, right, which means if this matrix is not singular, then we can find the solution by inversion, right? So we can start, write x star must be minus a minus 1 r. OK, so this would be the solution. So this tells you what? That if a solution to this system exists, it's unique. And you can find it in this way. OK? Now, ecologically, this point makes sense only when? when all the components of x star are positive, right? We've never seen minus seven zebras. And so it has to be positive. We call a fixed point with all positive component feasible, right? Meaning it, it can be achieved in a natural system. What is interesting about this condition is that if this condition does not exist and we do not have a feasible equilibrium, then you can prove, I did not include the proof, but you can find it in Hofbauer and Sigmund if you're interested, that then all the trajectories that start in the positive orthant, so imagine that you start all these pieces with some sort of positive density, and you follow them, right? That's what we call a trajectory. All of them either diverge to infinity or intercept zero somewhere, right? Meaning, to have coexistence between the species, we need to have a fixed point. If we don't have a fixed point, it means that either all, some, all of the species, in fact, go to infinity, or some of them will go extinct. Okay, so this is like the first piece of the recipe that we will need for, for, for our uh, uh, derivations later. Okay, so to have coexistence, this is a necessary condition. Now, having defined, imagine that there is such a fixed point, wouldn't it be nice to know whether trajectories that we start wherever go there. For this case of a single species, we saw that, that we can start this x at any positive number, it will always reach the same point, x star. Can we do the same in general? Turns out that do this in general is not that simple. We're going to try something like that slightly later. But for now, we can ask a more modest question, which is, if I have a system and it's sitting at this point x star, and I just like modify a little bit the densities of the species, infinitesimal perturbation of the density of the species. Will it go back or will it just like go somewhere else, right? This is what we call local stability or local asymptotic stability. And it just tells you, is this point X star locally attractive, right? So, so at least around it, do we have trajectories that will converge back to, to X? So to do this, uh, what we want to do is to track the development of a perturbation Right, and see whether the perturbation tends to die off in time or not. Right? If, it, if it amplifies over time, it means it will move somewhere else, at least initially. And if not, it means we have a locally stable equilibrium, meaning that at least initially the, the perturbation will die. And so just to do this like, in a slightly more uh, general notation, we can say we have some sort of equations describing the, the change of population i in time t. Right? And we can write this as some sort of function of all the species in the system. Right? So you can imagine this could be a function like log of Volterra or whatever other function that you want, right? as, so, as long as you can write it. A and what we have is like a, the definition of this x star means what in this context? It means that dxi dt, when evaluated at x star, right? so when I substitute for any x, the equivalent, like the corresponding x star, has to be 0 for all i, right? Or similarly, that fi of x star is 0. So that's my definition of a fixed point. 
And so the strategy that we're gonna take is to say, we have a system that is at equilibrium, X star, and then we perturb it slightly, we write an equation for the perturbation and see whether this equation decays in time. And to do this, basically, we, what we do is just like tailor expand around this equilibrium point, right? So, so we, ta we tailor expand in X star, and so we get like this type of matrix equation if we define delta, uh, delta X of zero is my initial perturbation, which you can think of like uh, X zero minus uh, X star, right? This is my initial perturbation, and I want to write an equation for that. What I can write is like F of uh, delta X, delta X of zero is gonna be, um, because I'm expanding around X star, it's gonna be F of X star, and then I have like a term that describes all the derivatives with of all the species with respect to, to, to the other ones, which is what we call the Jacobian matrix, evaluated at equilibrium, X star, times a vector delta X of zero, right? So this is my, my expansion. This matrix here is called Jacobian matrix, and you can fi think of Jij as being the derivative, the partial derivative of Fi of X, exactly what we have here, with respect to Xj. And then we're gonna do this for, for, for a lot of Volterra, it's very easy. So, so we're gonna do it later. And then this Jacobian evaluated at equilibrium point, what we have here, J at X star, in ecology is called the community matrix, so you see a lot of these community metrics. And there's, sometimes there's a bit of confusion in the literature about this, but you can imagine a system of equation has one Jacobian, right? If a system of equation has multiple equilibrium, there's gonna be multiple community matrices, one for each equilibrium, because I can substitute here X star one, X star two, X star three, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the different equilibria. And so this is what we call the community matrix. The name uh, comes from Levins. And what happens is that if X star is in equilibrium, what is F of X star? Zero, right? So, so then our equations that we can write is D delta X DT would be this part, but that's zero. So then what we're left with is just like the Jacobian, right? So we can write M delta X, right? So this is our, our, our equation. And this equation describes what? A linear system of ODEs, right? A linear system of ordinary differential equations, which happens to be the only system that we can really solve. And you can actually solve this. You've seen this as the exponential growth, right? If here I had just a single population, call it X, and this was a certain growth rate, R, what would be the solution? You've seen this like last week, if you were here last week. Right, so we would have dx dt is rx, right? Then my solution, x of t, would be x of zero, e to the rt, right? Here in analogy, we can write exactly the same type of solution, but in matrix form, right? So, so what we write, for this we are gonna use these matrix exponentials, so we can write delta x of t is what? Delta x of zero, our initial perturbation, e to the mt, right? Which is kind of funny because this is the exponential of a matrix and is defined exactly as you would think is defined, like as the power series, you know, if you have e to the x is equal to the sum for say, I don't know, n, what did they put in my notes? n is equal to zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. We could do the same thing with a matrix, right? But now we need to take powers of a matrix, and the only important thing is what is x to the zero, one? What is a matrix to zero? The identity matrix, right? So you can think of this as like being, a, if this is a matrix, e to the m is equal to i plus m plus m squared divided by two plus uh, m cubed divided by six, etc. right? So that's, that's the expansion. The interesting thing here is that there are some uh, operations that you can do with these matrix exponentials, 
And especially, like, you can do this sort of eigenvalue decomposition, right? So we can write uh, a matrix that, that can, can be diagonalized as, like, a product of a matrix of eigenvectors, a product, matrix of eigenvalues, matrix of eigenvector inverse. We can do this type of thing on the exponential. And so if we do this, then it's very clear what's going to happen, right? Because now we have delta x of 0. And then we take the matrix of eigenvectors, say, q, e to the lambda matrix of eigenvalue t q minus 1. Right? So, so this is assuming that we can diagonalize this matrix. And so now we have here a diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues. And so you can imagine if these were positive, what would happen? That this perturbation would grow in time. Right? If these are all negative, on the other hand, it means that for any direction that is described by the eigenvectors, these would, would decay in time. And so the, the condition for the stability of this uh, system is therefore very, very easy. And it's just to check that all the eigenvalues of these uh, metrics have, are negative. And by negative, I mean they have a negative real part. Right? These, these could also have uh, complex numbers as eigenvalues because these need not to be a symmetric matrix. But so then if we do this, we can just check are all the eigenvalues with a negative real part? If so, the equilibrium X star is locally asymptotically stable. If any of these eigenvalues has a positive real part, on the other hand, it means at least in that direction described by the eigenvector, perturbation will grow in time. And so, therefore, it will not go back to, to the original system. Because we don't even need to check all of the eigenvalues, right? Because you could think I can order the eigenvalues by the, the real part and call lambda 1 the one that has the most positive or the least negative real part. We call that the leading eigenvalue or the largest eigenvalue. Uh, if, that is the, if that is negative, then all the other ones are negative, right? So, so, so this is how we check for stability. As I said, this is, means locally asymptotical stability of X star. Local means what? That only works for infinitesimal perturbations, right? So if I do a perturbation that is large enough, I have no idea what I'm doing because I just tailor expand and take only the first term, right? And you would say, well, then I could do the second term, like I compute the Hessian of this, and then I add another term. The Hessian of Lotka Volterra is Lotka Volterra. So you go back to exactly the same problem that you had before, and you gain nothing by doing that, OK? So it's so lo local. And then asymptotic means what? it can take a very, very long time to get there, right? We're not saying anything about the rate. The rate would be basically the magnitude of these eigenvalues, right? If the real part is large, it will move fast in that direction. If it's small, very close to zero, it will move very slowly in that direction. In fact, if you're interested in like, uh, methods to detect tipping points and whatnot, they're all based on this fact, right? That there should be some direction that are the slowest direction, and you try to map those before they cross zero. All right. So local asymptotic stability. And then what would be interesting is to say something about global stability, exactly as we did for the one species case that it's easy to do. It's, it's a little more involved, as you can imagine, for, for, for multiple species. But here, just like to conclude like this uh, part, I just want to derive these uh, Jacobian matrix and the community matrix for, for the Lotka Volterra system with n species. And so all we need to do is to take derivatives with respect to each x of these equations. And so you can imagine like j, i, j, imagine that i and j are different for a moment. It's, a, it's a very simple to do because we, we get just like a, i, j, x, i. And then the only interesting part is like the diagonal, which if we derive, we can write as r, i plus the sum over j of a, i, j, x, j. Plus, because we have a quadratic term, we get another AII XI. Okay, so this is the Jacobian for the Lotka Volterra system, and Lotka Volterra system is a single Jacobian. Now, if we want to compute the community matrix, what we need to do is to put X star wherever we have X, right? So here, here, and here we have to put X star. But at equilibrium, what is RI plus the sum of AIJ XJ? At equilibrium, right? So it has to be what? It's this part, right? So it has to be zero, right? So then that's nice because when we substitute the equilibrium, this term goes away and we're left with AIIXI, right? So we have 
mij is equal to aij uh, xi, and then mii is equal to aii xi. So these two terms become exactly the same kind, right? And so in general, we can write the community matrix for Lotka Volterra saying d, these should be all stars, right? d of x star, a. So this is the, the community matrix for, for my Lotka Volterra system. Okay, so in the case of a single species, what can happen? We, we know there's only three things that can happen, right, with Lotka Volterra. Imagine that we have exponential growth, A0, R is positive, we grow to infinity, we crash to zero, or we reach some point between zero and infinity. These are the only three things that can happen, not very interesting. What is interesting is that the same exact equations, but with a, a different number of, of species interacting, can give rise to any type of dynamics. So this was a, a, the, the first few proofs of this fact, where Smale in 1976 and Hirsch in 1982. And so they started chipping away by showing, for example, that limit cycles, so periodic solutions that are stable, right, attractive, can happen when we have three or more species. And that when we have more than four species, we can get any dynamics, including chaos. Okay, so I wanted just to show you how do these things look like if we integrate this in a computer, again, assuming that my computer decides to collaborate. And so here I have like general code to just run the Lotka Volterra model. The only thing to notice, besides the fact that this is how you do a pro matrix product in R, is like percentage, uh, asterisk percentages like the matrix product is this line here. So typically when we're doing numerics, we want to put some sort of cutoff to call a species zero, right? So, so this is completely arbitrary, right? So I put 10 to the minus eight. So if anything is lower than 10 to the minus eight, I pretend there's nothing there, right? And this helps like a little bit with numerical problems that you could have integrating, especially if you're not using good integrator. And then we have like a function to plot the output that is given by this ODE, and then a general function that just takes R, A, an initial condition, runs the model for a certain number of time steps, and then shows you the result. So let's see whether we can copy this at least. Oh, yes, now I can copy this. And I just put like one little mistake here. Here we go. Okay, so if you copy and paste this code, then you can try the following code. This is taken, these are examples that are taken from a, a paper that I wrote with uh, Guri Barabash, that was a postdoc at the time, and is now a professor in Sweden, uh, and Matt Mikashka Smith, that is now a postdoc in, in, in Minnesota. And so here we want to just like to write a simple a paper showing that these ideas that we maybe have seen like in class of intra versus interspecific competition, Right, that we say inter must be larger than inter for species to exist in a competitive uh, Lotka Volterra with two species. They only hold for two species. Too bad. Wouldn't that be nice like, to, to have it for, for larger? And what can you do when you have larger systems? So first I'm going to show you a, a case in which like, dynamics converge to some uh, equilibrium, right, in which uh, a species is lost. You see this green species goes to zero. The other two species uh, can coexist. And what have we learned before? That for species to coexist, we need to have a feasible equilibrium, right? So we can try to solve this equation and see, do we get an X star with all positive component? If we do not, we are rest assured that either species will grow to infinity or something will go extinct. In this case, we count this, and you can see that this like if I solve this equation, I get a, a positive component, two negative components, meaning something will gonna, is going to go extinct, and in fact, it does, okay? So this is very interesting because it's very easy to tell these species will not coexist. It's very hard to say they will coexist. But not coexist, you just check this linear system and you're done. Now, a case in which we have uh, cycles, these are like sustained. Uh, these are non-sustained oscillations. They are damped oscillations that eventually get to zero, right? So this would be a case of a, lo uh, a locally stable equilibrium in which we have an imaginary part to the eigenvalues, this imaginary part will contribute to this cycling, right? So if we have purely a real eigenvalues, it will go just there exponentially. If we have a, a complex numbers, then they will go up and down. And, and so if we do this, what do we, we get in this system, right, that oscillates and then eventually reaches a, an equilibrium. And the equilibrium that it reaches is exactly the one that you would find 
if you were to solve the linear system uh, of equations, then adding to the complications, a case in which we can find co uh, stable limit cycles, so the species will uh, cycle. And then if we perturb the cycle, it will go back to the same cycle. So it's a cycle that is attractive in the exact same way that we looked at the uh, uh, equilibrium point that were attractive. Right, so you can integrate this for however long you want, and you will get these sustained oscillations. Again, to have a limit cycle, we need to have what? A feasible equilibrium point. It needs to be unstable, though, right? Because if it, if it were stable, if we were to clo start closing up, it will converge to the equilibrium, while it has to converge to the limit cycle. So this must exist, but it must be unstable. But you can see here, this is a feasible equilibrium point. Finally, a case uh, with the four species in which we get chaos. Now, finding like these parameters, it, it is true that logical Volterra can give you chaos. It's not true that it's easy to find at random, right? At random, you almost never find uh, 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 chaos. And what is interesting about that is that I really like to study random systems, and we will see a lot of random systems like uh, when we go on. But you can see these cycles, they're almost cycles, but in fact, they're not periodic. It never crosses twice the same point in, the, in this space of our end. But to have a chaotic attractor leading to coexistence, what do you need? You need a feasible equilibrium point. That, again, has to be unstable. Right? And so if you solve the linear system, you find that this is a, indeed a feasible equilibrium point. Question? So chaos means like non-periodic oscillation, that the system will, will keep oscillating, but it will never be twice in the same point. So you can imagine like uh, oscillation could have a period, right? The, this system goes back to where it was before after one year, right? Or a period of two years, right? The system will take two years and then goes back to the same point. If it never goes back to the same point, right? For all the species, for all the species it will now go back never go back to the same point, yeah. So if this uh, certain species is in the same place where it was in the previous time, another species has to be in a different place. Exactly, so there are systems in which there is a, some sort of uh, cyclic behavior for one species but not for the others? In all these things, you know, like these, these are typically bounded, like so, so like uh, the, even this chaos happens in a certain region of the space, so you can see here, for example, these species tend to go between zero and 0 0.75. So if it has to go up and down, eventually we'll cross the same number, I don't know, 50%, infinitely many times, right? But the point is when species green crosses 50%, uh, species blue is in a different place where it was before. Other questions on these chaos there? Limit cycles, I think you can find more easily. Uh, chaos, you really have to look for it. Yeah. So, so if I do, I don't know, if I put random parameters with, I don't know, 10 species, of course, it depends on the species. How do you sample the parameters? But like for typical, the first thing that comes to mind, you put, I don't know, all the growth rates to be between 0 and 1, and all the off-diagonal to be between minus 1 and 1. I would give you a probability of getting a limit cycle maybe 1 in a 1,000 or something like that. Chaos, basically 0. Yes? You write a program that looks for limit cycles or for chaos. <laughs> I don't know an easy solution to that. That's what I'm saying, that it's hard to, that's what I know for a fact, that it's hard to find these parameters because I had to find them. Other questions? Yes. This would be in the Ricker model, like a discrete equation. There's this very beautiful paper, if you've never read it, from, from Bob May in Science in 1973 or 4, that uh, is like this paper called like, uh, complex, Simple Models with Complex Behavior, where it, it goes through the bifurcations, in this case, of a very simple single species equation, right? But this, uh, it's a difference equation. These are differential equations. It's much easier to find chaos or whatever you want when you have discrete time. Right, so, so that's, a, that's a simpler. Finding like a 10 species chaotic attractor, I, I can guarantee it is not very, very easy to do by chance. 
All right, so what, what can we do when we have this sort of more complicated attractor? So imagine that we have like limit cycles or chaos, and how does this relate to the simple math that we've been doing of looking for equilibria by solving a linear system? What I want to show you now is that this equilibrium X star that we found in this very simple way is in fact the time average of the, of the dynamics, right? So that if I have something that cycle and I take the average over a whole cycle of the system, the average is the equilibrium point. Similarly, if I have chaos, then I don't really have a period, but like imagine that I take a very long time average. I take the average of all the species, is again the equilibrium. So not only this equilibrium must exist and must be unstable to have this type of dynamics, but also it tells us something about the average of the system. To do this, what we, what we write is first what we would like to find, which is the integral that is over there, right? We want to take an average. So, so what we want to do is to compute for each species the average over a certain time t. So we want to integrate between 0 and t uh, x of t in dt, right? And that would be my average x, right, for, for all the species. Now, to make things much easier, we're going to consider the case of a periodic uh, solution. For example, a limit cycle, right? And we, we say we start counting when the, the system is in this point, and we stop counting when at time t, large t, when the system went back to the same point, right? So that x of 0 and x of t are exactly the same. OK? The other piece of information that we need to do this calculation is uh, to be able to write the equation for d of log of x of t dt. So we write like a, a, a slightly different system in which instead of tracking x, we track the log of x. But because we're interested in cases where x is positive already, it's not a problem. And then you can do like a change of variable. And with the chain rule, you get like something very simple that is exactly as like the equation for x dx dt, but without the x in front. So you get just like r plus ax. Right, so, so, so this is in the notes. Now, if we have this equation, we can integrate both sides in dt, right? So we integrate this in dt and this in dt between 0 and big T. So the left-hand side, of course, it's easier to do because we have dt times dt. And so this, you can imagine, we just need to evaluate. And then we want to write 1 over t in front and 1 over t here. So here we are 1 over t. And then we need to just get a log of x in at time t, right? So this would be log of x at time big T minus the other bound, which is log of x at time 0. But, and here's where the simplification comes in, we know that x of 0 and x of t are identical. And as such, this is 0. So that, that's nice. Now we have to integrate the other uh, side. And so if we do this, like we have some time, uh, something that does not vary in time, which is 1 over t r. And then we have a matrix times something that unfortunately varies in time, which is 0 and t, x of t, dt. Oh, and there's 1 over t. Uh, in the R2, yes. Oh, yes. In the notes, there's a type. There should be a 1 over t. Oh, no, no, because it's a 0 t. Forget it. I, the notes were right, and I got confused. All right. This looks awful, but I want you to notice one thing, that this is exactly what we're trying to calculate, right? So this, we want to leave it alone. So we want just to get rid of the rest. How do we get rid of the rest? We know that this is 0, so we can bring r on the other side. So we have minus r is equal to a, and then the integral that we're interested in, a x of t dt. And then what we can do is to do exactly as we did before, that we can invert this matrix, bring it on the other side. right? So this one goes away. Here we get a minus 1, and then r. What is this? It's the fixed point, right? So this is equal to x. Right, so the, the fixed point is the average over this period 
of the density of all the species. Now, you don't have to trust my math also because I had this typo, but you can trust your own eyes. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually compute this, right? So, so we have these uh, solutions with a limit cycle. We, I don't really know the period, but we can just like discard the initial part and then take the average should be close enough. Right, so if I take these, discard the first time, 50 time steps, and then I, I compute the average. So you can see that this is my average computed over the time series minus modulo the first 50 time steps, and it's like 0 0.568, 147.284, and this is the solution that I would get by inverting the matrix. And you can imagine that these match very, very closely. And if I were to choose the right period, they would match exactly. Now, for, for, for a chaos, it's a slightly, a, you can use basically the same argument. It's a little more tricky, like, to do this part. So you have to say it is bounded, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, you can do the same thing. But also here, we can take the average of our four species system and confront it with, like, the equilibrium that we find. And you can see that, it, again, it's basically the same. Right? So, so the equilibrium, even though it's so, such a simple construct, Right, it's useful for, for at least two things. One, we need to have a positive, feasible, fixed point to have coexistence. Second, whatever complicated dynamics we have, which can be chaos, limit cycles, or whatever we want, we can find some comfort in thinking that the equilibrium is the average uh, of this. <coughs> Questions on this? All right. So. Now, a slightly more complicated thing that we can do is to try to look for global stability, right? So we've been talking a little bit about local asymptotic stability. And are there cases in which we can say this fixed point, x star, is going to be attractive from wherever we start, right? As long as we start the species positive, we will get there. OK, to do this, to prove global stability, what you typically do when you can, is that you want to write what is called a Lyapunov function, right? So you can imagine a, a function that describes the system, and then you would like to choose a function that always decreases in time, right? So if it always decreases in time, it should eventually reach a value of zero, and you would like this function to take value zero where? Exactly at the equilibrium that you want to prove it's globally stable, right? So, so if you can do this thing, which is, unfortunately, there's no obvious a rule to how to construct a Lyapunov function be besides looking it up on of Bauer and Sigmund or guessing, uh, then you, if you can do this, then you can prove uh, the global stability of, of the equilibrium. So in general, this is not uh, trivial to do, but there are some certain cases in which we can actually look at only the matrix of interaction and say, if this is a feasible fixed point, if the system has a feasible fixed point, then it will be globally stable. And these matrices are a bit peculiar. And so we have parameters R and A. And then if we can choose a positive diagonal matrix C, right? So C, which is diagonal with C i i greater or than 0 for all i, right? So if we can choose a positive diagonal such that C A plus A, A transposed C is positive definite, or in fact, now we're going to do the opposite, negative definite. So if all the eigenvalues of this matrix are negative, then if the system admits a, posi a positive feasible solution, then it's globally stable. These type of matrices, we call them Lyapunov diagonally stable. They go under very, very, very name, many names, but this is the name that I prefer. What is interesting is if a matrix, if this is true, then I can also take the matrix multiplied by any arbitrary diagonal that is positive, it would also be stable. This matrix, you can notice, is symmetric, right? Because we're taking basically the symmetric part of this matrix, so it, all the eigenvalues will be real. If they all are negative, then we have a Lyapunov diagonally stable matrix. For this uh, system, so imagine that this is true and that, that we have x star greater than 0. So by taking these two 
uh, pieces together, we can actually write this Lyapunov function. In matrix form, which is how it's in the note, we write W of X of T. It's just like one transpose, so you're, it's a sum, you can imagine, of D of Y. This actually, now I called it C, so there's a, there's a typo. Uh, C, X of T minus diagonal of X star and then log of X of T. So this is my Lyapunov function. Now, one thing that is important to, to go on with the derivation is that we want to rewrite the lotka Volterra system that we wrote as a dx dt is d of x times r plus ax. We would like to write it as a function of the equilibrium, right? So we know that the equilibrium x star is equal to minus r, a minus a minus one r. Right, so so we, we also know that a x star has to be equal to minus r. Right, so, so what we can do here is to substitute this r with a minus a x star, right? By doing that. So this is equal to d of x. And then here we can put minus a, a x star plus a x. Right, which we can write, of course, as d of x, and then a times another vector that now it's x minus x star. So this is exactly the same if this point exists, right? So if we can solve this equation, then this equation is exactly the same as that. Okay, if we can do this, then we can also write the equation for the log of x. So we write d log of x dt, which if you remember was just r plus ax, now it becomes what? It, it, it's just going to be a times x minus x star. Okay. So with this thing in mind, we take this equation, derive with respect to t, and we want to show that these... Dx is x. Sorry? D log, don't you have to have dx equals x to be this equation, or just in dx? This is fine to be in the x, assuming that this equation has a solution. I think, if I followed what, what I was trying to copy. When you did the d log there, you had x, you didn't have dx, you had x, uh, you, the equation was not the dx, you know, it was just a few dx equal to x, right? So this, yes, like this log, d log x dt, for, gener for log of Volterra model should be r plus ax. And so when, when I do the same exact trick here, I get a times x minus x star. So if I take like this, I want to take derivative with respect to time, because I want to write the evolution of this uh, quantity. This is just a number, right? And so I want to see that this number uh, decays in time. A and um, if I do that, then I can take derivatives with respect to time. So this will become dx dt. This will become d log x uh, dt, right? And then I do a bit of manipulation of this thing. Uh, it's in the note, I, I, I don't think I have. Do we already have the, like the coffee break or I have another few? Let's finish just this part and then we, we can switch gears after the, the, the coffee break. Right, so making a very long story short, we have these, these d, d, dt, we can write it as x minus x star, ca, x minus x star. Right, so imagine that if this ca were to be a negative definite matrix, do you know what a de negative definite matrix is? One of the main property of a negative definite matrix, say b, is that if I have a y, a b, y, is lower than zero for all y in Rn. Right, so it's always negative. So this would be always negative if these were to be a positive definite matrix, a negative definite matrix, which would mean that this equation would always decay, right? We would have a rate that goes to zero, and then we'll reach zero when? When this is zero. So when x is exactly the equilibrium, which is what we would like to do. Unfortunately, this matrix is not by itself like a negative definite matrix, but we know that its symmetric part is, 
So what we can write is just take this, because this is symmetric with respect to this part and this part, right? This, this should be a transpose. Then we can write this as the sum of two other equations, so dv dt, and we write the same type of thing, but we divide by two. And here we put like the transpose of it. And then x minus x star. Right, so you can see that now if this is negative definite, the same argument holds, so this equation will always be negative besides at exactly x star in which it's zero, which means our equilibrium point will be globally stable. Okay, if you have a symmetric matrix, it's sufficient to just do this part. Right? If you have a non-symmetric matrix, then you have to do this. Which means also what? A symmetric uh, stable matrix is the upon of diagonally stable. So, I, so it will be stable if you multiply by any positive diagonal, it will be still stable. Yes? Maybe? Questions? Before a coffee break, and then we'll do questions after the coffee break. There's no coffee break. Oh, there's no coffee break. Okay. Yes, but I, I'm not abiding by the rules today. I will abide by the rules tomorrow. <laughs> because I have some other stuff to do. But, uh, but we can do questions now. Let's do questions. Let's do questions on this more mathematical part, and then we have something more fun to conclude. So far, so good. Like, we've seen a bunch of things. Maybe I can recap. If AX equals to minus R is not singular. So if, if this matrix uh, uh, is not singular, we have a solution. Then we call this an equilibrium point. If it's positive, we call it a feasible equilibrium point. A feasible equilibrium point must exist for species to coexist. It's also the time average of the dynamics, which is good. We know how to determine whether this is locally asymptotically stable. And if the gods are smiling and we can write a matrix C such that this is true, then that this is globally stable. Okay, so this is the recap of what we see so far. Questions? Yes? Yes. So stability, like what I mean by stability is like the, the, this idea of if I start the system somewhere, does it go to this point or to this limit cycle or to this whatever attractor that I have, right? So that's, that's my, my definition of stability. And then I distinguish between locally asymptotic, local asymptotic stability, which means this is stable, meaning like this trajectory converges to this either limit cycle or, or the simplest case, a fixed point, only locally, right? Only around this object, they go there. But then if I start far enough, they could go somewhere else versus global stability in which I can start anywhere. As, as long as I start with positive densities, I always end up in the same place, right? I always end up in the same equilibrium, the same limit cycle, right? This is the definition of local versus global. Local stability analysis, as we saw, you just write this Jacobian, evaluated equilibrium, this community matrix, check its eigenvalues, and you're done. Global stability, in general, it's very hard to do unless you're in one of these special cases. And the special case that I showed is among the most general that you can easily do, right, in which we have this type of matrix. Does that help? Yes. Uh, if, you have, if, if you can ensure that the, the, there is a local stability in the system. Okay, thank you. If you can ensure that there, there is a local stability in your system, but you cannot uh, assure that there is global stability, does that mean or indicate some kind of mo uh, the possibility of mode instability in the system? Right. Yes. So the question is, if I have a, a local stability, but I cannot show global stability, there's two cases. Either you cannot show global stability because we don't know that there's another trick that we can do and that we could prove it, case A. Case B, which is more interesting, is this fixed point or this whatever attractor is locally stable, but then if I perturb it far enough, I get into some other attractor, right? It would be the case of multiple stable points or multi-stability in general, right? And that, that is something that happens a lot in ecology. It doesn't happen a lot in logical Cavalterra in a, in a certain sense, right? Because we know that if there is a fixed point that is feasible, it's unique. There cannot be like the same three species coexisting at two different uh, points. But there could be a, what we call like a boundary equilibrium, right, in which some species are extinct and the other ones go to some other place. 
So in that case, you have multiple stable states. Other questions on this? All right, so, so like, let's get into a more a, a fun, I would say, a part of the lecture, which has to do with large uh, stability of large communities, right? So, so we saw that to determine local asymptotic stability of, of this large Kavataro system or any system, what we need to do is like to know all of the parameters, compute all the equilibria, compute the Jacobian, substitute the equilibria, and then we can say something. In general, it's very hard to go and measure all these numbers or all these functions in, a, in nature. We will see actually lectures on how do we determine which functions, you know, like should we put in in our equations. But in general, it's very hard. And imagine that you have 100 species or 2,000 species. There's like 8.7 million species in the world. Uh, you know, like even like if you're thinking of bacteria, you can find thousands of species in like a gram of like dirt. Uh, and so like, that seems quite hopeless, right, to, to parameterize all of these. In fact, it's not hopeless exactly. Like in the last lecture, we will try to do something with actual data and, and try to, to fit similar models. But it's hard. And, and so does it mean that we cannot say anything intelligent about these systems unless we measure all these numbers? That's the question. And, and Bob May, in 1972, attempted to answer this very question of saying, can we say something intelligent about large ecological systems without having to measure all these parameters? And the way that he did this, which I think it was brilliant, was to consider random matrices, right? So, so because we don't really know how to measure all these numbers, we just say these metrics or these parameters are sampled from some distribution. And then we try to describe the typical behavior of these random e ecosystems. And in, par in particular, he worked directly with this community matrix, right? So he thought of this community matrix as a random matrix, right? So instead of building like a system of equations, finding the equilibrium, putting all the parameters, we just start from the end. We pretend that there's an equilibrium point that is feasible, that it exists, and then we linearize around this equilibrium. We're saying the coefficient of this matrix here, m, are just random numbers. And he proposed a very simple uh, model for, for, for our random matrices. I'm going to put it here so that it's close to our community matrix. So if you remember from, from that section, we have that in the community matrix of, um, of a large Cavalterra model, we have that the diagonal elements are proportional to self-regulation or like intraspecific interactions right here. Right? And so this would be what prevents a species to, from reaching infinity. And then these have to do with uh, interspecific interactions, right? So it makes sense that May chose to have different rules for intra and interspecific uh, interactions. So our goal is really to write a program, if you will, it's like some algorithms to build a matrix M. And then we have rules to choose like Mij and then Mii, right? So we have different set of rules for the off diagonal and diagonal elements of this matrix. So for Mij, we can set it to zero with probability one minus C. And then otherwise, if we, simply, we take a sample, you know, it's distributed, like for example, we take it from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared with probability C. And so if you look at the off diagonal elements, if C is small, imagine C is a number between zero and one, we call it connectance. If C is small, then most of them will be zero, right? If C is large, say one, all of them will be non-zero. And all the non-zero are taken from some random distribution. And here I put a distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared. Turns out you can put any distribution with mean zero and sigma squared, as we will see later, but for now we say it's a normal distribution. So this is how we build the off-diagonal part of the matrix. And then the diagonal part of the matrix, we just put a certain number like if for, for simplicity, like minus D. So we were saying there is self-regulation, right? So a negative diagonal means like you have some sort of quadratic term that curbs your growth, right? So that you're self-regulating. And, and this turns out to be a very convenient uh, way to choose this, right? So, so let's, let, we, we can, because this is really an algorithm, we can write code that does it, right? So in this code, I built like a matrix, like me, type of matrices, with these uh, normal distributions. So I specify how many species do I have and 
what is the connector C, what is my, uh, uh, like my diagonal D, and what is uh, the, the standard deviation of the distribution, and then I can build this matrix. So if I build this matrix, then you know, like, uh, I can choose whatever I want, like some parameters, and then get a random matrix. One thing to notice that maybe you don't remember from linear algebra is what is the average of the eigenvalues of a matrix, right? So to determine stability, we care about eigenvalues, right? And these eigenvalues in general can be complex numbers, right? So we have a, a real part that we put on the x-axis, an imaginary part that we put on the y-axis. For stability, we need that all of the elements, like all the eigenvalues in the community matrix must be left of zero, right? So this is what we mean. So what is the mean of the x-axis, like the mean real part of the eigenvalues? Anybody remembers from linear algebra? Trace. It's the mean of the trace, right? Or it's like the trace divided by the size, right? So, so I have that, like, the sum of all the eigenvalues of a matrix is just the trace of the matrix, let's say this matrix called M, which is also like the sum of all the diagonal elements, right? So the mean of these will be just this divided by N, divide by n, divide by n, right? So by setting the diagonals to be minus d, I'm basically saying the mean of the eigenvalues is minus d over n. If it is, in fact, minus d, because I have to multiply by n, divide by n, it goes away. Yes? We're not interested in the real part of the matrix in order to, to be stable, so why are you looking for in the, in the positive real part? The negative, they, they have to be here. Yeah, negative, here. All, all, if anything is here, we have instability. Right, so, so we need to be there. And so by choosing minus d as an average, imagine it's here, that's a good start, right, because at least we're in the right half plane. <laughs> you know, if we were in the opposite, we would be uh, worse off. Right, and in fact, if this is the case, we can always choose a d that is large enough that this system will be stable. Right? So, so these we can choose kind of freely. If we make it very, very, very large and negative, fine. Right? We will have stability. All right. So now I want to show you something that is very easy to do, which is like I just draw a random matrix, like May did, compute all of its eigenvalues, and then plot the eigenvalues in this kind of plane. If you do this, something really like stunning happens. And what happens is that all the eigenvalues of a random matrix built in this way fall in a circle, right? And in fact, if n were to be very large, this would be basically a perfect circle with uniform distribution of eigenvalues, right? So if you, if you think of this now as a circle, now we have our circle. We know what is the center of the circle is minus d. All we need to do to determine stability is to compute this radius, right? If the radius is smaller than d, we will have stability. If the radius is larger than d, like it's here, right, what will happen is what? That because we have very, very, very many species, we're bound to have one eigenvalue that is positive as soon as we cross, right? And in the case of n infinity, then immediately after we cross, we will get uh, to, to zero, to instability. All right, so then how do we compute this radius, right? That's the whole business of this, is just to compute this radius. And it turns out that this circle is, in fact, the typical behavior that you should expect if you knew about random matrices, which I didn't at the time. For example, may did know a little bit about it. And uh, this happens to be what is called the circular law, because it makes a circle. And the statement is like, take a non-symmetric matrix, S times S, with coefficients that are random variables with mean 0 and variance 1. This is what this means. And then take the limit of s that goes to infinity, so the size that goes to infinity. And because, like, if you take the size that goes to infinity, the eigenvalues go to infinity, which is bad, because then you cannot do anything. What you're going to track is the x divided by the square root of s, such that when I increase, like, the, the size, I basically decrease the, 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 the value of these numbers. If you do this, you see that, like, this uh, distribution, which is called the empirical spectral distribution, so the distribution of the eigenvalues in the complex plane, converges to a circle which has a radius of 1, and it's centered at 0. Right? So, so then we know that if this diagonal 
if this uh, standard deviation were to be one, we had no diagonal, imagine the diagonal is zero, then this would be a circle centered at zero with radius what? We just need to compute this radius, and if the radius of x divided by square root of s is one, it means that the radius is basically square root of s, okay? Now we can think what happens to the, the, the standard deviation, what happens if we, if we make it larger? Well, we, in our case, we have that the expectation for mij, right? Because we, I, it's either zero or it's taken from a mean with, from a distribution with mean zero, so the expectation is zero. Right, and if the expectation is zero, the variance of this random variable would be the expectation of mij squared, which is what? If this zero squared is zero, and this would be sigma squared, right? So, so we will have c, because this happens with probability c, c sigma squared, okay? So now we have to say the radius is what? Square root of a n, square root of this thing, right? That would be a, a, a circle if we didn't have the diagonal. So basically, what we have is that this a radius of the circle would be square root of s the size times c the connectance times sigma squared the variance of the coefficients. And now we can choose the center however we want. And so to ensure stability, how should we choose the center, right? We need to choose the center to be larger than the radius, right? This has to be larger than the radius. And so we get this equation with this inequality, right? C sigma squared has to be lower than t. Right? So we can try this uh, on our, our matrix. This was like the main result of May 1972. So I, I want just to draw this limit to show you how accurate this thing is. So the black line now is the calculation of this thing. And you can see it matches very, very nicely. For n that goes to infinity, it will always match very nicely. <laughs> if not, it depends on the distribution. What is very interesting about this is why it's like that uh, May's work became also so influential is that here we put like a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared, but we can put anything we want. As long as the mean is zero and the variance is C sigma squared, potato, potato. So, so like if I do this with a uniform distribution, you get exactly the same circle. This thing is called universality in random matrix theory. So many of these properties are universal, meaning they depend only on the moments of the distribution, the mean and the variance. They do not depend on the distribution per se. Now, what is the limitation of this thing is that here we're saying each species interact with each other species completely random. Some they benefit me, some they don't. And what I do to their species is completely unlinked with what they do to me which is not what the way we tend to think about community ecology, right? If I think of predators and prey, like the, the predators are harming the prey, the prey are benefiting the predators. So, so I would expect some sort of correlation between these numbers, right? And, and so it turns out that if you want to introduce a correlation between these numbers, what you need to do is just to invoke a slightly different law that is called the elliptic law that takes into account the correlation. So instead of sampling these numbers independently, we sample them in pairs from a bivariate distribution that they can have whatever correlation that you want. And in the simplest case, which is the one in which the means are still zero and we have a correlation, it's very easy to modify this calculation. You find it in the notes. And so all we need to do is to take this and put another term that is one plus rho, where rho is the, co the correlation between the off-diagonal elements lower than zero. So you can see that if I put rho is equal to zero, meaning independence in this case, I recover like May's result. And uh, this is like uh, work that I've done with uh, C. Tang, my first student at the University of Chicago, and you find like the reference to the paper below, but just to show you, this is how we could build uh, this matrix. And then just to show you a few examples of this, if I run this code now, you see that instead of having a circle, now we have an ellipse. If the correlation is positive, this ellipse is horizontally stretched, which means what? That we need to choose a much larger D to stabilize it compared to the case in which there was no correlation. But you can see also here that the uh, predictions are quite good. 
it, it, so this could, you could think of competition, right? It would have a positive correlation, minus against minus, or mutualism, plus against plus. If we have a consumer resource interaction, we would think plus goes with minus and minus goes with plus, so we would have a negative correlation. And if we do that, what we find is still an ellipse, but now it's an ellipse that is vertically stretched. And that means that it's much easier to stabilize this because we just need to shift it up a little bit to make it stable as opposed to a, a, a lot. Right, so, so this is just like a simple case of this uh, uh, random uh, matrix uh, approach. I, if you're interested in this stuff, there's like this review in 2015 that we wrote that introduces like the main tools. And in fact, there's a chapter that I wrote with Jacopo that is coming up in uh, this new edition of Theoretical Ecology, the book, uh, 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 which we are also happy to share, which is a little more up to date. And that's what I have to, for today. Thank you. So we still have uh, some more time for questions. If Yes. Thank you. Uh, so when you were explaining the random matrix uh, mm -hmm. model, sigma plays the role of the amplitude of the noise, right? Right. And C, what would be the role of C? Sparsity. Like if many species interact with each other, you would have a high C. If everybody interacts with everybody, C is one. If you only interact with very few species, then C would be closer to zero. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Uh, does it mean that modalism, for instance, makes the, the community more unstable? The, 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 the uh, means what that modalism becomes unstable? Yeah, in this case, like if you're thinking in these random matrices where mutualism, we're saying random matrices, random community matrix with plus plus would surely be less likely to be stable for the same diagonal than um, a plus minus pairing. Uh, for instance, uh, with mycorrhizas and uh, plant communities, they, they indeed make uh, the plants uh, resistant to, to stress, like a rainfall or something like that. They indeed uh, make the community more stable in that sense. Yeah, I think that this kind of, it's a metaphor that does not translate very easily into what happens if I put these three species together. What it's saying is I have a, some matrix, right, that is, I derived in this way like that we were doing here. If that matrix happens to have positive correlation between the, the, the coefficients, that's less likely to be stable. Then what happens with the mycorrhiza? Who knows, like, it, it's not even obvious, like, even that you would get the matrix with plus plus, right? I don't even know that. Depends on which equation do you write, right? And Lodge Voltaire, for example, for mutualism is a terrible model, right? Because, because we, what we see is like species growing to infinity all the time. More. Well, some, someone has asked you how did you find the parameters for the chaotic dynamics and, and the logical Voltaire system for three species, I guess. And your answer was that you build a script to yes. find these parameters. But what there's in the script? How do you analyze right. the dynamics to say it's chaotic? That, that's, that's, that's absolutely non-trivial, right? So you can very easily tell, are these, uh, you know, like, um, Equilibria that I can do. It's very easy. Like you just check, like what is the variance? If it's zero, after uh, you know you let the transit go, check the variance. If it's zero, it's a it's a, an equilibrium. Now, if it's not an equilibrium, you could think this might be cycles. So if there are cycles, there are easy way to check whether something is cycle. For example, you take this time series, you do like powers of these uh, things, and you should peak, you know, or wavelet or whatever you want. Like you will see peaks at a certain periods and all the multiples of this period, then you know that it's a cycle. And so you do this by exclusion, and then you just stare at it, and it's chaos. There are tests for chaos, like that, uh, uh, th there are some that are actually very clever. They work well if we have something like deterministic, like we do here, if we do simulations. You can use this test for chaos. For example, there's one that is popular, it's called the zero one test for chaos. You can look up, uh, I can send you the reference. It would work well in these cases, so you could really test this directly. 
it does not work very well when you have noise, right? So for empirical data, it would not work. Uh, or even like if you have simulations, but there's very, very many things, it might not work nicely. But even if you can just like uh, flag certain parameters for something, then you can look at them like more closely. That could be one way to do it. Uh, there is a way to know if a natural system we are trying to model, it is uh, chaotic or stochastic in some sense. So maybe, maybe it's an open question. I don't know. Yes. So stochastic, all systems. <laughs> chaotic, basically, as a rule of thumb, no system. Right? Almost zero. Like, it's very hard to, to, to observe like, real like, nice chaotic dynamics in natural systems, so much so that if you do that, you get a paper in nature. <laughs> so that's how I measure like, rarity like, of these events. Like, it's that hard. Right? So, so there are a few documented cases. They tend to be like, in very controlled conditions. And there are very, very limited cases in which you see this in natural population uh, outside. We have no idea why, by the way. That is an interesting question that I've always been interested in. I don't have a good answer for, for that. That's why it's not in my notes. So we still have time for maybe one long or two very short questions. Someone else? So uh, you showed us uh, how in the, the, with random matrices you uh, you, you use stability as stability of the fixed point, right? But usually what you're interested in the, is actually persistence of all species in the system, right? So I think maybe you covered this later, but um, can you relate this, this to persistence, not only to load your stability, but also persistence of all of the species? Yeah, or is it related somehow? Yes. I mean, something that is locally stable, I would say it has a higher chance of being persistent, just because if I started close enough, it will be yeah. persistent. Uh, this is the only case where we looked at persistence in general, right? So this is a case yeah. in which we can prove like global stability. Other than that, it, it gets a little tricky, right? Because what you need to show is like that if you get very close to zero for any of the species, it moves away, and then that there's some ceiling too, right? Because if it grows to a certain number, it tends to go away. Then you can say these orbits like, will be bounded in this sort of cube. Yeah. And that there are techniques to do that. It typically, it's very ad hoc, right? That if you have this particular structure, you can do this. If you have the other structure, there's nothing you can do or something like that. So that's why people have focused a lot on local asymptotic stability. Not because it's particularly interesting per se, but it's because we can do the calculation, right? Yeah. So, so but I was actually much more worried when you have, uh, you have ins unstable systems, but actually they they persist. Oh yeah, right? exactly. This is the, exactly. The so so this is not even like guaranteed. Uh, as we were saying, in fact, to have a limit cycle or chaos, we need instability, right? So so, so what happens after? We we will do a little bit of what happens once you cross instability in, in some like simplified setting tomorrow. But 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 that's a very interesting question, and there's no obvious answer to to this. So maybe one more last minute question. Last like comment. Well, you can take the last. Yeah. So uh, when the the, the 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 circular law, it's like uh, a limit theorem, right? So for large matrices you have this, this limit, this yeah. limiting behavior, right? So far, how large a uh, matrix does yeah. this work well or? Yeah, it's exactly like you would expect, like a, I don't know, central limit theorem. That's also like that, right? It depends a little bit on the distribution yeah. and whatnot. There are some ways to break this. For example, if you put C very, very, very small, right? Imagine that you decrease C when you increase N, then you will break the circular law. For like normal distribution, I would say 30 species would look exactly like 300,000, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so for other distribution, maybe it takes a little longer to converge. There, there aren't as many studies of, because these are studied by mathematicians more than statisticians, so they only care about, you know, in the limit of n that goes to infinity. It works for practically, you know, like all the settings that we care, provided the distributions are not too weird. 
So, unless there is one very, very short question, I think we are all hungry, at least I am. So let's th thank Stefano once more. For thank you. <laughs> and just very briefly, please, those giving a flash talk in the afternoon, uh, try to be back 